almighty word, chaos and darkness heard, and took their flight. Hear us, we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Savior, who came to give those who in darkness live, healing and sight, health to the sick in mind, sight to the inward blind, now to all of mankind let there be light. Spirit of truth and love, life-giving holy dove, speed on your flight. Move on the water's face, bearing the lamp of grace, and in earth's darkest place let there be light. Gracious and holy three, glorious Trinity, wisdom, love, light, boundless as ocean tide, rolling in fullest pride through the earth far and wide, let there be light. Blessed be God the Father, and the only begotten Son of God, and also the Holy Spirit, for he has shown us his merciful love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned, in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Jesus Christ, 
Son and the 
Holy Spirit, to God who is, who was, and who is to come. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever heard of the Bechdel test? If you have, I imagine you might not like it. But if you have not, you obviously have no opinion on it yet. And whether you've heard it or not, I think it's worth hearing about it with an open mind. The Bechdel test seeks to identify and underscore books and movies that have strong female characters. The Bechdel test originates as a feminist critique of formulaic plots and characters in much of our popular culture. Now, whatever your initial reaction might be, I think there's a point to raising the problem. I grew up in the 90s, where most stories were paint by numbers, and they often revolved around three characters. The leader would obviously be a young white boy, with another kid added from a diverse background, and these two would be joined by a female character. And almost always, there was some initial resistance from the white male protagonist, who was more often than not wearing a bad baseball cap backwards. It was the early 90s, after all. The other two characters would always start by doubting the girl's abilities, and eventually she would rise to the occasion, and he would eventually have to admit, admit that she was pretty good for a girl. You might think that this was all a one-time thing, but this structure and the characters happened over and over and over again. And so perhaps there is a value in the Bechdel test, especially at a time like this, where we're sensitive toward developing stronger characters of all stripes. Because living through some of this formulaic stuff, you felt it was patronizing not only for the groups in question, but for anyone who had to watch it. The Bechdel test involved three steps. First, you need at least two female characters. Second point, two of those female characters need to be in a conversation solely with one another. And lastly, says the Bechdel test, that conversation couldn't be about another male character. So a story that involved a boy and a girl studying for a calculus test would not pass the Bechdel test. Two girls studying for a calculus test probably would, unless, of course, they actually spent the whole time talking about boys rather than about calculus. That would obviously fail the Bechdel test. Now, you might think I'm about to apply the Bechdel test to the Bible, and you would be right. In passing, I note that most of the books of the Bible do not pass the Bechdel test directly. This is not too surprising. Most people back then were illiterate, and the few who could read and write were men. It was a trade. Life was oriented around the household, and women generally did not go far from it. Most men, for that matter, generally did not go far from the household. Of all the books of the Bible, it seems to me that only the book of Ruth would pass the Bechdel test, where Ruth herself, the protagonist, tells her mother-in-law, Naomi, that she's willing to go wherever she, her mother-in-law, might go. Your people, she promises, will be my people. Your God, she promises, will be my God. Ruth, the widowed pagan Moabites, joins her bereaved Israelite mother-in-law to, be to become a part of Israel itself. But my story for, my question for Trinity Sunday is not whether the Bible passes the Bechdel test for women. It's whether the Bible passes the Bechdel test for the divine persons of the Trinity. If it is so important for developing strong characters that they have a chance to be on their own and speak for themselves, does the Bible do this for God? Let's go back to the three tests modified for our purposes. First, 
we need at least two divine persons as characters. Check with one despair. Second, at least two of these divine persons need to be in a conversation with one another. Okay, check. Though just about every direct citation of conversation between Father, Son, and Spirit is witnessed by additional human protagonists. Third and final question. Does this conversation between divine persons end up bringing up the created ones, almost inevitably? Well, Christ is sent from the Father and brings forth the Spirit in order to reveal to us the hidden life of God himself. And he does this in no small part by conversing with the Father. He is seen at various points introducing the Father, praising the Father, commending his disciples to the Father. He identifies with the Father, calls upon the Father, and invites his disciples to do the same. In the various Gospels, Luke in particular, Christ withdraws from the disciples in order to pray to his Father in the intimacy that they would have enjoyed from before the foundation of the world. The Gospels clearly establish Christ as divine, as the one who reveals the Father and sends the Spirit. But this divine story is also our story, and this is where the Gospel parts ways with the Bechdel test. For none of the conversations between Father, Son, and Spirit exclude the created order from consideration. In the very beginning, when God said, let there be light, he was speaking of the created order and the light that would come to shine on all men who come into the world. In the very beginning, when God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness, male and female, he created them. God was considering humanity for what it was, the capstone of all creation. The inner counsels of God revealed throughout the Old Testament focus on man to the point where the psalmist would ask, what is man that you should keep him in mind? or the Son of Man that you would dwell on him. This is also the case in the Gospels, such that even when the Father lets his voice resound from the heavens, he does so to proclaim his Son to all who have the ears to hear. We have this confirmation from Christ himself, who in the Gospel of John proclaims, It is not for my sake that you hear this voice, but rather for your own sake. When Christ rises from the waters of his baptism, the Father proclaims his identity for all to hear, even if not everyone hears him. When Christ's garments become whiter than light itself on the mountain of transfiguration, and the Father proclaims his identity to Peter, James, and John, he also commands them to listen to the Christ whom he has anointed. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. When Christ praises the Father for revealing himself to the simple, even as he remains hidden from the proud and the learned, he keeps the conversation relatable to a wider frame than simply divine persons. And even those times when we seem not to come up in the conversation, when Christ commands his Father to glorify his own name, or when he begs his Father in Gethsemane to let this cup pass from him, the context remains firmly fixed on God's saving plan for all mankind. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit enjoyed the fullness of life from before the foundation of the world, since before always. God did not need to create in order to achieve fulfillment on his part. And yet, throughout the whole trajectory of salvation, God does not stand aloof from what he has made. Rather, he identifies so closely with man that he becomes one. Salvation is not simply, then, an exercise in God's remote and disinterested altruism, Rather, it involves the opening up of his inner life on those he has made. It involves nothing less than the adoption of all mankind into his family, which has been a family of divine persons since before always. The unity of divine persons in one essence, and the distinction of each divine person from the other as persons who are more fully alive than we will ever be apart from him, shows us the full sweep and scope of our destiny as we are incorporated into his inner life. And so the Bible fails the divine Bechtel test, or rather, the Bechtel test fails the Bible, because the divine persons are distinct without being separated. And in the operation of his grace, and the adoption of all created persons who persevere in his grace into his own inner life, God promises a unity with distinction, 
a unity of all men and all angels who persevere and are triumphant, the church triumphant. The Bechtel test demands rather separation, the separation of women from men in order to establish their own identity, or in our improvised case, the separation of the divine from the human. But we can no more separate the divine from the human than to divide Christ himself, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, in whom both God and man exist without confusion or separation, even as they exist with distinction. God's saving story, then, becomes a way to evaluate any other worthy story, and even our own history. The greatest story ever told becomes the way to evaluate how great the story that is told is. For any story that exalts separation, any story that confuses distinction to the point that it denies the unity that we are meant to share, threatens to divert us from the gospel. And this takes place when we separate one another by race, by sex, by political opinion, by any facet of the human experience. All are one in Christ Jesus. And yet, though one, we remain distinct as many parts in one body. Our unity and distinction reflects then the unity and distinction found within the Trinity itself, in which our differences find their fulfillment in a still greater unity than anything we might have achieved on our own. The Trinity certainly helps us see this, but we do not need the Trinity to recognize the limitations of something like the Bechtel test. Many stories with strong female protagonists fail the Bechdel test. Ellen Ripley from the movie Alien, Princess Leia from Star Wars, or Janine in the original Ghostbusters are not muted when they run into male characters. Rather, their personality and distinction shine through all the more as their well-developed characters clash in contrast with their counterparts. When Princess Leia mocks Darth Vader to his face while most men would tremble to cross him, or when she sasses Luke Skywalker for being too short for a stormtrooper, we see more about her character than anything the Bechtel test might have envisioned. This distinction works the other way, too. It's not surprising when the mobster of Michael Corleone treats men like a gangster in the first and second Godfather movies. But when we see him mistreat his own wife, we learn far more about his character than anything the Bechtel test might have envisioned. From the very moment Adam woke and saw Eve in the garden, both sexes have found meaning and fulfillment in how they relate to each other. This distinction does not demand the strict separation that modern critical theories like the Bechtel test demand. Rather, it finds its fulfillment, that distinction finds its fulfillment, in the unity of God's own plan, that plan that God has had in mind since before always, reflecting his own in unity and inner life. The Gospel fails the Bechtel test because it cannot separate God from man. We have been invited into the very inner dynamic of God's own life, and contrary to the expectations of the revisionists and critics of our time, that does not destroy man, but rather ennobles him. For as Saint Irenaeus would say, the glory of God is man fully alive, and man's life consists in the vision of God. But even more amazing than our destiny, is the way we get there, the Incarnation, where man's distinction with God becomes the grounds for a still deeper unity, one to which every person on earth and every nation under heaven is called in justice and charity. As Saint John Paul II loved to say concerning the full sweep and significance of human redemption, in Christ man is revealed to himself. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. 
and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop, Archbishop Leonard Blair, and for all the bishops of the Church, that they may lead us to the charity of the Good Shepherd. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our civil leaders and all in authority, that they may work for true and abiding peace among all nations, but also work for reconciliation and the tranquility of order within our own nation. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for all who are made in the image and likeness of God, every citizen of these United States, every human being under heaven, born and unborn, that our civil leaders and all of goodwill, Christians and all of any sort of belief, may work for the recognition of their dignity in the very image of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who knows and loves and by extension permits us to do so as we are conformed in his image. For them and for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all those facing any particular need this day, for the sick and the sorrowful, for the homeless and the homebound, for those who feel abandoned or bereaved, for all who are facing unemployment, for the terminally ill, for the radically handicapped, for the dependent aged, for all working for greater justice for them or for those facing any other particular need, for them and for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for those who will die this day, that as they prepare to depart from this world, to whatever degree they might be estranged from God or man, God in his mercy and in his grace might lift them up and reconcile them to himself and to their fellow men as they prepare to depart from this world. For this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And let us pray also for the faithful departed, that they may come to see the face of God, having all their sins forgiven through the charity of our prayers and of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. For them and for all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, who in your Son have promised us, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened to you. Grant, we pray, answer to our petitions, for we make them in the confidence and in the boldness of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The God of Abram praise, who reigns enthroned above, ancient of everlasting days, and God of love. To him uplift your voice, at whose supreme command, from earthly rise and seek the joys at his right hand. By himself has sworn, I on his oath depend, I shall on eagle wings upborne to heaven ascend. I shall behold his face, I shall his power adore, and sing the wonders of his grace forever. Dwells the Lord our King, the Lord our righteousness, triumphant o'er the world and sin, the Prince of Peace. On Zion's sacred height, his kingdom he maintains, and glorious with his saints in light forever. God who reigns on high, the great archangels sing, and
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands, for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Sanctify, we pray, by the invocation of your name, we pray, O Lord our God, this oblation of our servants, and by it make of us an eternal offering to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for with your only begotten Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord. Not in the unity of a single person, but in the Trinity of one substance. For what you have revealed to us of your glory, we believe equally of your Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that in the confessing of the true and eternal Godhead, you might be adored in what is proper to each person, their unity in substance, and their equality in majesty. For this is praised by angels and archangels, cherubim to and seraphim, who never cease to cry out each day, as with one voice they Oh, 
Hosanna in the highest. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world. Together with your servant Francis our Pope and Leonard our Bishop, and all those who hold him to the truth, and on the Catholic and Apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, and they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls and hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Prasadimus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation, and counted among the flock of those you have chosen, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory. The mystery of faith, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty for the gifts that you have given us this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, life, and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. To us also, your servants who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, Gracious and grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. And may us we beseech you into their company, not laying our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and with your spirit. On you stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On you stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. On you stay, qui tollis peccata mundi, Dona nobis pace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Since you are children of God, God has sent into your hearts the Spirit of his Son, the Spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. Let us pray. May receiving the sacrament, O Lord our God, bring us health of body and soul, as we confess your eternal Holy Trinity and undivided unity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Holy God, we praise thy name, Lord of all. Yeah.